This is Adel Gasli. I'm going to present to you part six of the chapter about magnetic circuits. In this part, I will introduce permanent magnets used in electrical machines. A permanent magnet is capable of maintaining a magnetic field without any excitation provided to it. Permanent magnets are normally alloys of iron, nickel, and cobalt, and can be manufactured in different shapes and sizes. They are characterized by a large BH loop with high retentivity, which means high value of residual flux BR, and high coercive force, high value of HC. These alloys are subject to heat treatment, resulting in mechanical hardness of the material. Permanent magnets are often referred to as hard iron and other magnetic materials as soft iron. I invite you to watch this movie on YouTube to understand further how magnets are manufactured. The link is given below in the description. They help run motors and generators, among other things. Magnets occur in nature, but two centuries ago, people figured out how to make them using electricity. You could say it was a take-charge situation. You can't see or feel the force causing this globe to levitate, but it's not magic, it's magnetic. To make magnets, they must first create a sand mold of the magnet shapes. They load this pattern of four magnet shapes into a machine that fills it with sand. They remove the pattern and smooth the surface, dimpled by the machine's lid. Then it's back inside, but this time, the machine pumps in gases to chemically harden the sand. It takes just seconds to solidify. They lift out the sand slab, revealing the impression of the magnet pattern. It's now a mold. Magnets come in many shapes and sizes, as do their molds. Now they're ready to mold the magnet shapes. They take copper, cobalt, sulfur, nickel, pure iron, aluminum and titanium. They load all these metals into an electrical induction furnace. It generates a pulsating electromagnetic field that heats to more than 1600 degrees Celsius, melting everything into a molten soup. They pour it into the sand molds. The molds burst into flames because the gases that harden the sand are highly flammable. They slide the blazing molds to another part of the foundry and knock them to the floor. Then they bust them open with a sledgehammer to get air inside so they cool down and the gases burn off. They shovel everything into a bin and sort the metal shapes from the sand chunks using, what else? A magnet. The molded pieces react like ordinary metal. They don't yet have magnetic power. Some are shaped like rings. Threaded onto a copper pipe, they'll be used in electric motors. They place the ring-covered pipe in a much larger tube. Then they center it by packing silica sand tightly around it. The sand will hold the rings in position during the next step. They seal both ends with concrete, allowing the inner copper tube to protrude slightly. Then it's into another electrical furnace. It heats the tube full of magnet shapes until it's red hot. This primes them to accept an electromagnetic field, which will be delivered by this metal rod. They slide it down the center of the copper pipe and clamp it in place.
Water keeps the pipe from melting as they deliver a low voltage, high current charge in a cylindrical formation, important for motor magnets. They break open the seal. The process has left the ring shapes mildly magnetized, but most importantly, it's oriented the magnetic field properly. They grind away any rough edges. At this point, all magnets are pretty useless. But this machine will empower them. It delivers an electromagnetic charge to the metal, which magnetizes it. The establishment of that weak magnetic field earlier has laid the groundwork for this moment, ensuring that the magnetization is properly oriented. Now that's some serious magnetic muscle. In their various forms, magnets continue to exert a lot of pull in our society because their invisible power helps keep so many things running. We consider the following magnetic circuit structure, which combines hard and soft iron magnetic materials. A coil is used to generate and control the MMF and hence the magnetic field intensity H. This magnetic field intensity H is used to generate a magnetic flux density in both the soft and hard ions. Let's assume that the magnetic material is initially unmagnetized. So we start at the origin point of the BH locus. Now if a large MMF is applied, the magnetic flux density will establish at point A of the magnetization loop. On the removal of this MMF, the flux density will remain at point B, which corresponds to the residual flux BR on the BH locus. Now we can remove the magnetized hard iron material and use it as a permanent magnet. Let us see how we can make permanent magnets. The following video that you can find on YouTube using the link below explains well the physics behind the magnetization of ferromagnetic material and their BH locus. Ferromagnetic materials, such as iron, are composed of microscopic regions called magnetic domains. These magnetic domains act like tiny permanent magnets that can change their direction of magnetization. We now see the microscopic structure of a new and magnetized ferromagnetic material. Inside such materials there are many magnetic domains with their magnetization axes pointing in random direction. The resultant magnetic field of this slab of iron is zero. When we apply a small magnetic field to this slab, what happens is that the domains begin to move, and the domains which have a favorable direction of easy magnetization grow larger. This growth is reversible as long as the field stays very small. If we turn the field off, the magnetization will return to zero. Eventually, for high enough fields, when we have moved all the domain walls and magnetized each crystal in its best direction, there are still some domains which happen to have their easy directions of magnetization not in the direction of our external magnetic field. It takes a lot of extra field to turn those magnetic moments around. So the magnetization increases slowly, but smoothly, for high fields. Saturation occurs when practically all the domains are lined up, so further increase in magnetic field intensity cannot cause further alignment of the domains. Now let us see how the demagnetization of the permanent magnet can take place. Let us Consider the previously magnetized hard iron case where the residual flux density at point B is BR. If a reversed magnetic field intensity of magnitude H1 is now applied to the hard iron, the operating point moves to point C. If H1 is suddenly removed, 
then the residual flux value will be at point D. If H1 is removed and reapplied, the BH locus follows this minor loop. The minor loop is narrow and for all practical purposes can be represented by the straight line CD, known as the recoil line. The line is almost parallel to the tangent X B Y to the demagnetizing curve at point B. The slope of this recoil line is called the recoil permeability mu rec. For Alnico's magnets, this recoil permeability mu rec is in the range of 3 to 5 mu zero, whereas for ferrite magnets, it may be as low as 1.2 mu zero. As long as the reversed magnetic field intensity does not exceed H1, the magnet may be considered reasonably permanent. If a negative magnetic field intensity greater than H1 is applied, such as H2, the flux density of the permanent magnet will decrease from B1 to the value B2 at point E. If the field intensity H2 is removed, the operation will move along a new recall line EF. Now let us see some approximate design of permanent magnets. Now let the permanent magnet previously studied be magnetized to the residual flux density denoted by point A in this figure. If the small soft iron keeper is removed, the air gap will become the active region for most of the applications. In order to determine the resultant flux density in the magnet and in the air gap, let us make the following assumptions. First, there is no leakage or fringing flux and no MMF is required for the soft iron. From Ampere's circus law, we can write that the sum HMLM and HGLG is equal to zero because there is no excitation coil and we've assumed that the MMF in the soft iron is negligible. Thus, we can write that HM equals minus HG multiplied by LG over LM. We know that the magnetic flux is continuous in all media of the structure, so we can write that BMAM is equal to BGAG, where AM is the cross-section area of the hard iron and AG is the cross-section area of the air gap. We also know that the air gap flux density BG is equal to mu zero HG. Now combining these three equations, we can obtain the relationship between the hard iron flux density BM and the flux intensity HM as shown by this equation. Notice that this equation represents a straight line through the origin and is called the shear line. The intersection of the shear line with the demagnetization curve at point B determines the operating value of B and H of the hard iron material with the keeper removed. If the keeper is now reinserted, the operating point moves up the recoil line BC. This analysis indicates that the operating point of a permanent magnet with an air gap is determined by the demagnetization por portion of the BH loop and the dimension of the magnet and air gap. The best material is the one that will give the highest residual flux BR and coercive force HC. High residual flux leads to high permanent flux and high coercivity leads to more robustness against demagnetization effect. The volume of the permanent magnet is equal to the cross-section area AM multiplied by the length LM of the magnet. 
From the previous equations, we can deduce the expression of AM and LM as shown here. Thus, the volume of the permanent magnet material that is required to establish an air gap flux density BG can be expressed as a function of the volume of the air gap, the permanent magnet and air gap flux densities, and the flux intensity as shown in this equation. This equation can be used to design a permanent magnet for certain magnetic specifications. Now let us see some permanent magnet materials and their main characteristics. A family of alloys called alnico, which uh, stands for aluminium nickel cobalt mixage, has been used for permanent magnets since 1930s. Alnico has a high residual flux density as shown in this figure. Other material, such as ferrite permanent magnet materials, have been used since the 1950s. These have lower residual flux density, but very high coercive force. The figure in the middle shows the demagnetization curve for ferrite D, which is a strontium ferrite. Since 1960, a new class of permanent magnets known as rare earth permanent magnets has been developed. The rare earth permanent magnet materials combine the relatively high residual flux density of alnico type materials with a greater coercivity than the ferrites. These materials are compound of iron, nickel and cobalt with one or more of the rare earth elements. A commonly used combination is samarium cobalt. The demagnetization curve for this material is shown in this figure. Another rare earth magnet material that has come into use recently is the neodymium iron boron. The magnetization curve of this alloy is also shown in this figure. Notice that the residual flux density and coercivity are both greater than those of samarium cobalt. It is expected that this neodymium iron boron will be used extensively in permanent magnet applications. Different types of magnetic materials can be used to achieve performance and cost trade-off. For instance, ferrite permanent magnet materials are used for lowest cost. However, they result in lower power density due to lower energy density of the ferrite materials. Ferrite materials also have positive temperature coefficient of Br, which means that if the temperature increases, Br also increases, which is a positive feature. Samarium cobalt magnets are used for higher energy density, higher temperature operation, and stable performance over a wide range of operating temperatures due to their low temperature coefficients of Br and corrosion resistance. However, samarium cobalt is the most expensive material and is primarily used in aerospace and defense applications where high temperature operation without performance degradations is very critical. The most widely used permanent magnet material is the neodymium iron boron type, which has the highest energy density and is most cost effective due to overall reduction of copper and steel needed for a given torque rating of the motor when it's applied in motor applications. However, the main drawback of neodymium iron boron magnets is the negative temperature coefficients of Br and the need for corrosion protection. Nickel coating is usually used on neodymium iron boron magnets to prevent corrosion. This is the end of this part and the chapter about magnetic circuits. Thank you for watching this video.